Colin's Last Stand needs your help. If you like what CLS does, whether here on SideQuest in the eclectic interview podcast series Fireside Chats or the retro and nostalgia-fueled show Knockback, please consider showing your support at patreon.com slash Stand. Doing so not only ensures that CLS keeps making content, but it also gets you cool perks, including exclusive podcasts, early access to shows, the ability to vote on show topics, and much more. Thank you for your kindness, generosity, and support. Without you, Collins Last Stand cannot and will not exist. Now, on to the show. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Collins Last Stand Side Quest right here on YouTube. My name is Colin Moriarty. As always, I hope today's video finds you and yours very well. Today, I want to talk about the Sony-owned PlayStation exclusive studios that have been closed in the last 10 years. While it's quite easy to celebrate what Sony has going today with its first party, and it clearly has the best first party in video games, there were studios that were part of that family that no longer exist. Six of them, to be exact. And so today's video kind of focuses on them. Who were they? What did they make? Where did they come from? Where did they go? Before we begin though, I do want to talk about two studios that were considered by some people to be first party that I don't agree were first party, but that nonetheless I wanted to touch on here so you know why I didn't talk about them in the video itself. The first is 989. Now I don't consider 989 to have been a first party studio per se because it was a publishing arm, a development arm, and also a brand as well. There's a lot of confusion there and a lot of the spirit that went with 989 kind of got transferred to Sony San Diego. So I don't really consider 989 part of this mix. The other team is a small Japanese studio called Contrail that went away nearly 20 years ago and they're more akin to the XDev initiative that Sony has had going for some time. And what XDev is is basically incubation using Sony centric producers to create second party games. So that's still going and that's what Contrail was. But again, they weren't really making games on their own. So with that out of the way, let's jump into the video. I hope you enjoy. Since we're moving sequentially by date of closure, there's only one studio we can start this video with, one that's been quite nearly forgotten, even among the PlayStation faithful, Incognito Entertainment. Incognito was located in a completely random place for a game dev, Salt Lake City, Utah, and was founded by a small squad of personnel that once worked for now-defunct studio Single Track, which you may remember as the team behind a trio of important PlayStation 1 hits, Twisted Metal, Jet Moto, and Warhawk. Now, the single track connection is important because what happened to that developer is a sign of things to come with not only Incognito, but the studios that in turn spun off from it. It's also relevant because many of Incognito's key players, including Scott Campbell, David Jaffe, and Dylan Job, all had their hands in future second party affiliated teams making PlayStation exclusive games during the PS3 era. While single track was gobbled up by larger companies and eventually closed and almost completely lost to history, a bizarre wrinkle considering the important IP it created out of whole cloth. Incognito entered the PlayStation 2 era with a bang, and with quite a bit of single track's former talent in tow. Formed in 1999 during the late PS1 days, the team was ready by 2001 to bring Twisted Metal Black to PlayStation 2, and then brought that game to the online realm the next year, something quite revolutionary on PS2, a console that didn't even have an internal modem. It was at that point that Sony acquired the studio for itself. War of the Monsters, Downhill Domination, and Twisted Metal head-on followed before the PS3 era brought around the cult hit Calling All Cars and the all-new Warhawk. Unfortunately for Sony and Incognito though, what happened to Single Track a decade earlier was about to happen again. The founding of a parallel studio and the brain drain that resulted killed Single Track, and it killed Incognito too. Following Calling All Cars release in 2007, but before the new Warhawk launched, the duo at the head of Incognito, David Jaffe and Scott Campbell, opted to form yet another Salt Lake City planted studio called Eat Sleep Play, which went on not only to port Twisted Metal head-on to PlayStation 2, but famously made PlayStation 3's Twisted Metal, which landed with a bit of a commercial dud. Eat Sleep Play was originally given the classic three-game deal by PlayStation, but that never came to fruition, with Jaffe leaving that team in 2012. Meanwhile, Dylan Job, who took the reins of the studio following Campbell's and Jaffe's exit, ended up forming Lightbox Interactive in Texas, a new team given yet another three-game deal that ended up yielding only one, Starhawk. As for Sony, it quietly pulled the plug on the drowning incognito in 2009. It wasn't until 2012 rolled around that the next three studios in Sony's family would be shuttered. The bad news began in the second week of January, when the quaintest member of the family, Big Big Studios, was closed. The UK-based developer made only handheld games, and was certainly the least known team in Sony's stable. Founded in 2001 and purchased by Sony in 2007, Big Big never really had a chance, being relegated by its own admission to PSP, which even at its mid-aughts peak was largely relegated to secondary status internally. Still, Big Big delivered the goods, 
Its maiden game, Pursuit Force, was released in 2005 and did fairly well critically and commercially. Well enough to convince Sony to purchase Big Big outright on the eve of the launch of Pursuit Force's sequel, Extreme Justice, two years later. Unfortunately for Big Big though, sustained sales and critical acclaim simply weren't there, even after it abandoned Pursuit Force and very ably brought sister studio Evolution's IP Motorstorm to PSP in 2009 in the form of Arctic Edge. And once it began work on a PlayStation Vita launch game heavily reliant on touch controls and quirky gameplay, a largely forgotten title called Little Deviance, the die was cast. Not even five years after Sony ponied up and purchased the studio in order to call it its very own, it pulled the plug on Big Big, the same day it also made Sony Cambridge into Guerrilla Cambridge, which is another team we're going to unfortunately touch on shortly. Relegated to PSP and later to Vita, Big Big never really got a chance to shine. Only a couple of months later, the executioner returned, this time with its eyes on American studio Zipper Interactive. Unlike Incognito and especially Big Big, Zipper had pretty deep, sustained roots in the gaming industry, having formed in 1995. And unlike Incognito and Big Big, Zipper's roots were initially planted as far away from the console space as you could imagine. In the mid to late 90s, they were making PC games instead, including 1999's beloved MechWarrior 3. But it was Zipper's SOCOM franchise that made it a hot entity, and attracted Sony's attention. And between 2002 and 2011, Zipper released four core games and several spin-offs in what would become the PlayStation brand's earliest and most important online hit, long before online play was anything close to being ubiquitous, standard, and essential. Indeed, Sony was so smitten with the studio up in Redmond, Washington, that it purchased the team in January of 2006, bringing it permanently into the fold. But then things went a little haywire. Zipper's first post-acquisition game also happened to be its first PS3 game, MAG. MAG, an acronym for a massive action game, was an FPS that allowed up to 256 players in a match, and when combined with PS3's early install base problems and the fact that MAG wasn't SOCOM, the game disappointed both critically and commercially. So Zipper pivoted back to SOCOM with SOCOM 4 in 2011, only to find itself victimized by the worst possible luck. Literally the day after it launched, PlayStation Network experienced the infamous, prolonged, 23-day PlayStation Network outage, not exactly the best thing to happen to an online-only game. In short, SOCOM 4 was toast. Thankfully, Zipper got one final shot, and in my estimation, it delivered, with the early Vita third-person tactical shooter Unit 13. But like with Big Big and later with Guerrilla Cambridge, working on Vita proved to be the death knell. In March of 2012, Sony unceremoniously killed Zipper Interactive, along with any likelihood that eager fans would ever see a SOCOM game again. The third Sony-owned team brought to the chopping block in 2012, mere months after an identical fate befell Big Big and Zipper, was a huge one. Indeed, it was the closure of this studio that perhaps elicited the greatest outcry from players. We're of course talking about Sony Liverpool, sometimes known as Studio Liverpool, and once known as Cygnosis. Sony Liverpool was, other than Naughty Dog, the oldest studio in Sony's stable, having been formed in the mid-80s over in the UK. It was also acquired very, very early. Indeed, it was acquired in 1993, about two years before PlayStation 1 would even launch. And interestingly, the original PlayStation was only a partial focus for the team. It brought dozens of games as both developer and publisher, to PC and even to Saturn and N64, before going full first party at the turn of the century. That move came with a name change too. This is when Cygnosis became Sony Liverpool and veered away from Sony as a whole and to the PlayStation family more intimately. Cygnosis slash Sony Liverpool was best known for games spanning from Lemmings to Shadow of the Beast to Formula One, but in reality, PlayStation fans love it for two other franchises, Colony Wars and Wipeout. Colony Wars has been dormant since that beloved trilogy of games came to PS1, but Wipeout lived a longer and much more fruitful life, with many entries across PS1, PS2, PS3, and PSP. And lo and behold, would you believe that it met its 2012 death sentence the way Zipper and Big Big did with a Vita game? Wipeout 2048 was the final game to ever come from Sony Liverpool. Players loved it, but Sony apparently wasn't all that impressed. And just like that, 27 years of gaming history was snapped out of existence. It's remarkable because after all of that bloodletting, it was three and a half years until another Sony studio would bite the dust. 2013, 2014, and 2015 passed uneventfully in this regard, but by 2016, the one Sony studio that was facing clear writing on the wall, Evolution, was the next to fall. Based in the UK and founded in 1999, Evolution Studios had one focus and one focus only, driving games. And unlike fellow PlayStation-owned studio Polyphony Digital, which created and maintains the world-renowned Gran Turismo franchise, Evolution took some different twists and turns, with its wild and fantastical Motorstorm franchise acting as a strong contrast to GT. But it was far more serious games in the World Rally Championship franchise on PS2 that initially attracted Sony's attention. Following the success of the original Motorstorm on PlayStation 3, which was a near-launch title for the console, 
Sony purchased Evolution outright, coincidentally on the same day as aforementioned UK studio Big Big. Two games and the drama surrounding those games ultimately killed Evolution Studios. The first was MotorStorm Apocalypse, launched in 2011, unfortunately around the same time as the devastating 2011 earthquake and tsunami that devastated Japan. Due to what happened in the real world and its parallels to the in-game content, the game was not only delayed, but it barely saw the light of day in Japan at all, and Sony seemed universally disinterested in promoting it. That wasn't exactly Evolution's fault. What was Evolution's fault was how severely and obviously it dropped the ball with what was supposed to be a PlayStation 4 launch title in the form of Drive Club. When the game finally limped on a PS4 in late 2014, a year after the console's launch, it was still heinously broken, and you could tell that the game was mismanaged and bungled throughout development, having been delayed multiple times throughout the course of an 18-month period. Sony's patience with the studio was clearly maxed out, which wasn't at all a surprise. After laying off half the studio in 2015, Sony shuttered it completely in early 2016, perhaps removed from the realities of money, the only Sony studio closure that actually made any sense to players. By this point, almost all of the unfortunate dominoes have fallen save one, Guerrilla Cambridge. Founded in 1989, Guerrilla Cambridge was at various times known as StarClear Software, Logotron Entertainment, and Millennium Interactive, before being branded as Sony Cambridge, sometimes known also as Studio Cambridge, following Sony's acquisition of the team in 1997. This UK-based dev was actually at the heart of some random and obscure PlayStation exclusives, particularly in the PS2 era with Primal and Ghost Hunter, but of course it was the beloved medieval franchise that put Sony Cambridge on the map. Following the release of the totally random, very accessible, and user-friendly PS3 game TV Superstars, however, Sony took the studio in a bit of a different direction. It put it tangentially under the umbrella of mega-successful Sony-owned Dutch studio Guerrilla, and rebranded the team Guerrilla Cambridge. Only two games launched under the Guerrilla Cambridge moniker, the awesome Killzone Mercenary on Vita, and the impressive but obviously stranded Riggs, which requires a PlayStation VR to play. With back-to-back -back sales flops revolving not around the quality of the games, but on the lack of install base the hardware running those games suffered from, it was a true surprise when in very early January of 2017, Sony put an end to Guerrilla Cambridge, bringing its number of studios down to, depending on how you count them, somewhere around a dozen. While still buttressed by the likes of Naughty Dog, Sucker Punch, Media Molecule, Guerrilla Games, Japan Studio, Polyphony Digital, and others, PlayStation very easily has the best first-party stable in all of video games, but one can't help but wonder how that stable might look even more robust if even just a few of these defunct teams manage to live to see another day. All right, that's it for this episode of Colin's Last Stand SideQuest. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, leave your comments below. I'll be reading them. Thumb up the video if you liked it. Thumb it down if you didn't. And of course, please spread the word of Colin's Last Stand, SideQuest, Fireside Chats, Knockback, etc. with friends and family. It really does help. I will waste no more of your time today, but I do appreciate the time you have given me, and I really appreciate your kindness, love, and support. I will see you next time for more SideQuest. Until then, keep on gaming. <laughs>